Good evening. I'm Mayor Dean Brookie, and I'd like to welcome you to the June 2nd virtual City Council meeting. Uh, I'd like to begin this evening with a roll call. Uh, we have a roll call, please. Councillor Bettine. Councillor Noseworthy. Present. Councillor Yusuf. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Baxter. Present. And Mayor Brookie. Here. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to ask our counselors if, to identify any actual or perceived conflicts of interest for any of the topics we have on our uh, schedule this evening. Hearing none, I will move on to uh, public participation. I'd first like to read a, a brief statement given the circumstances of the nation today uh, regarding uh, George Floyd. Um, prepared this with the city interim city manager myself and uh, uh, representing uh, city council um, the city of Durango is a community that has always supported each other and that and we have seen the, that to be particularly true during these unprecedented and difficult times most of us cannot uh, begin to understand the depths of, of suffering and anger caused by the inexcusable actions in Minneapolis we recognize that Durango is a diverse community we have a history of assuring that law enforcement is applied in our community in a fair and equal manner, no matter the circumstances. Now, more than ever, we must look inward and then diligently reassure that each and every person in our city is treated with respect and dignity they fully deserve. We stand with the community and those who are exercising their rights to peacefully protest across the country with a voice that demands that we do better as a nation. Our hearts are with, uh, are with the friends and loved ones of George Floyd, and we grieve with them over the painful loss of a son, father, family member, and a friend. Uh, it's, uh, I'd like to thank the peaceful protesters that held the vigil Friday night. Uh, it was uh, very, very interesting in, in, uh, uh, in our park and uh, march down Main Avenue. And I'd also like to uh, thank Chief Bramer. Uh, I truly believe that our city Durango police officers, veterans, and new recruits alike have been trained appropriately and adopted a culture of civility and respect under your leadership, Chief. Thank you and all of our police department for demonstrating behavior that commands the respect you deserve from our community. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move into public participation. And I'd like to uh, just uh, comment about our new uh, process here, which is uh, virtual communicate public participation and we will now hear public comments uh, on any specific agenda item in this case just public participation to keep the moving meeting along we are limiting comments to three minutes you will be muted once you reach that limit and even if you are in the middle of a sentence uh, please use the raise hand function if you're using the zoom application to indicate that you would like to provide a comment uh, and then Mitchell will let you in uh, uh, if you are calling into the meeting using your telephone, press star nine to raise your hand. Our moderator will announce the next person to speak and will unmute you at that time. Please start by stating your first and last name and your home address for the record. Be advised this is a live television broadcast. Your video camera will show up when you speak or if you dialed in using your telephone, your phone number will be, will be displayed. With that, can we have the first participant? Mitchell? Um, hi, everybody. My name is Mitchell Carter. I am your moderator this evening. Um, at this point in time, if you are here to give uh, comments during public participation, please use the raise hand function within Zoom. We do have a list of attendees, but I do not see anyone raising their hands. So I'll just uh, give it a little bit more. Oh, we have our first one here. Um, I'm allowing Victoria to speak. Um, so three minutes starts now. And you may need to unmute yourself, Victoria. Can I start three again? Yes, there you go. Thank you. Um, Victoria Schmidt, 1001 East Fifth Avenue. I wanted to speak on two things. One is public meetings. Um, right now it's important to meet face to face with residents uh, who are struggling. Um, and who you are representing and uh, COVID is not running rampant 
um, in our community. However, fear and confusion around regulations is running rampant. Uh, fortunately, the state is on a roll to issue guidance this week for gatherings and public spaces. So hopefully with these coming out, public meetings will be held um, actually in the public again very soon. With respect to the mask order, um, the narrative has become that the businesses wanted it. But in fact, the council made a decision before there was any survey results from the businesses. Um, thus, how do you know whether the business that expressed support did so that because they were actually in favor of the mask mandate or did they do it because they were afraid to express opposition to an order that was already in the works that would threaten their business license? Um, beyond lack of public input from the business community for the mandate, the city um, has, and, and to my knowledge, has had no official health recommendation for the order. San Juan Basin Health, who was in attendance, did not directly recommend it, and the Centurion report that was cited in the meeting did not recommend it. Uh, with the order, the city has interfered with the business's ability to evaluate what is suitable for their conditions, and it has put businesses into a, between a rock and a hard place with customers who expect them to force uh, a mask and HIPAA laws that could result in lawsuits if they do. People have been going to grocery stores, Walmart, being on the trails um, th throughout this entire thing, and we've had zero deaths. COVID is not rampant. It's almost non-existent in our community. This is like, um, you know, a, a, a fairy tale that we're talking about. So, One minute left. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, it's not surprising that we haven't seen a lot of issues with COVID. Um, because we've got great space between us, we've got fresh air, we've got sunshine. These are the factors of health, not masks. As a matter of fact, the way that people use masks in this community is not at all in line with what CDPHE recommends and is on their website right now. So my request is that you rescind the order and that anyone who is in favor of keeping the order clearly articulate your rationale. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, if there is anybody else who would like to make comments during public participation, please raise your hand now. I am not seeing anyone else raise their hand, Mayor. Very good. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Victoria. And uh, Victoria, if you if you ever want to have a face to face uh, on our common street here, uh, I'd be glad to. <laughs> I'll be walking my dog in about an hour and a half. So <laughs> come on by uh, and we could have a more fruitful discussion. Uh, the uh, and we may have we will we, be talking about this a little bit later on, uh, probably in uh, reports and actions as well as to uh, the face mask ordinance. Um, with that, um, we have uh, we're moving on to proclamations and presentations. Review of the uh, 5.1 is review of preliminary data relating to the May sales tax report. So maybe we have a sales tax report, please. Good evening, Mayor, members of City Council. Um, my name is Devin Schmidt. I'm the Acting Finance Director for the City of Durango. I am going to share my screen out here quickly and provide you, as promised, with a um, update on the sales tax for uh, May. So um, we actually had a very surprising and positive um, actuals. And so um, what I wanted to provide that as of June 1st, preliminary city sales tax represents a 15% reduction for May collections. And so that's based on April sales. Um, so these are the same projections as previously presented, except that May reduction overall was previously listed at a 70% decline. And the actual preliminary numbers represent a 15% reduction. So um, wanted to make a note that, um, you know, these numbers are preliminary. We uh, collect our sales tax um, that's due on the 25th of each month. And so we do have some numbers still rolling in, but we wanted to provide numbers live as they're coming in. This is very positive for the city because this changes our overall decline to 22% and $6.8 million. 
um, $4.3 million for the general fund. And so um, it's, it's very, very positive that um, we are actually seeing this over what we had previously anticipated. Um, so wanted to provide that update. I also wanted to update council on our city of Durango sales tax deferrals. Thus far, we have 49 requests for sales tax deferrals. Nine businesses do not qualify um, under the outline of the order. Uh, this will continue to rain, remain in effect um, 90 days after the city is no longer in the emergency order. And we have $50,000 total in deferral to date. And I don't have a slide on this next um, topic, but I did want to let council know that to date we have just around $17,000 in costs related to the COVID-19 um, pandemic costs. So that's um, city costs related to that. Um, so just a very brief and quick update for you all. Um, you know, these is this information is coming in and we're trying to keep council updated as quickly as possible. Um, and so I would be happy to take any questions if that would be appropriate at this time. Councilors, um, any, any this is great, relatively great news, as great as it can be uh, at this point, um, uh, which is not surprising for, uh, given the activity that I've seen in the past uh, couple of weeks, especially, but uh, also the activity for essential services prior to that. So um, any other questions or of Devin at this time? Um, and my question would be is, Amber, are you going to provide any more detailed information, cash flow reports, revenue expenses later in the city status, or is this the extent of our financial conversation? Um, this evening, this is the extent of the conversation. We have um, the, one of the folks in our finance department was on vacation last week, and we are still working with the Adams group related to um, our financial statements. So I don't have any additional information to provide this evening, um, but we'll have an additional update for you next week at study session. So on this, at this study session, will we be getting cash flow reports and basically uh, profit and loss statements with uh, impacts on, on uh, reserve funds for all the funds? Devin, are we good on that? Um, yes, uh, Councillor Pro Tem Baxter, we should have all that information for you at the next study session. We're gonna try and include our May numbers. Um, you know, we're trying to keep you guys updated as quickly as possible and um, have been getting some really good feedback from Council and the Strategy and Long-Term Finance Advisory Board. So um, just trying to provide updates as quickly as possible and then just the information that um, Council would like to see. And I think Melissa was going to provide, I would imagine, provide some updates later on the Strategy and Long-Term Finance Advisory Board outcomes. So, so I, um, I just would like to suggest that it's, uh, essentially five months into this year. And we don't have a profit and loss statement um, for the general fund or any of the other funds that's been presented um, to the public and we don't have a cash flow. So um, I'm concerned. And I think that this information is required in order for staff and city council to make good management decisions and policy decisions. So um, I would, I believe that this is an essential service of the city um, so I would like you to consider that concept of it being an essential service, because without this kind of information, we can't make good decisions, staff can't make good decisions, our strategy and long-term finance committee can't make good decisions, our advisory boards, um, the dedicated sales taxes <clears throat> are, will be struggling with making good decisions. Um, so the concept that this is an essential service that the city provides um, is something I would highly suggest that we look at in the same vein as some of our other essential services. We will have something for you at the next study session. So next Tuesday, we will have something. It may not be exactly what you're looking for, and we'll go from there. Well, I guess what I'm it saying... It could be exactly what you're looking for. It could not. I just want to let you know that we will give you what we have, and then we will take feedback from that point. So whether it's exactly what I'm looking for or not, it, for me, is not the question. The question is, is it the information being provided for us to make good informed decisions and choices about policy and the expenses, for example, that we're, that we're cutting? Because if, our, if we're seeing that our revenues indeed are not dropping as fast as we expect them to or as much as we expect them to, possibly we're doing too much expense cutting. So it goes both ways. And I think that this is an essential service 
that the city needs to provide to staff and city council, as well as the advisory boards in order to make decisions. Okay, so we will have those balance sheets through April, like through the end of April. We don't have main numbers yet because it's not gonna be ready for your review at the Tuesday meeting. Sure, so what we talked about is that you you essentially have the revenue portions already for May. You have um, estimated or at least fairly accurate because that was what was just presented tonight. And we've talked about the concept that in reality expenses are pretty much evenly spread across a year. So essentially one twelfth of our budgeted expenses or what you see as a reduced expense would be um, applied for each month. And that would give us a fairly accurate estimate of what our expenses are because you probably have through March actual expenses. I think you actually have through April if the- Through April. Right, so you have the actual expenses. So the only thing you would be estimating would be May to compare with May's revenues. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think- We'll have that for you. Yeah, so. Yeah. I have a question for, for the ahead. interim city manager. Oh, if- Don't go ahead, Barbara. Okay, thank yeah. you, thank you. So um, Amber, if I look at this, and this is great news on the reduced, reduction in the sales. Um, if I look at this and the significant uh, uh, model scenario we used, which the significant effort was going to show a $7.3 million reduction in expenditures, granted that if we follow Councillor Baxter's comment, you may be pulling some people back from furlough in the finance department, but 7.3, you're predicting 6.8, I think it was. So right now, if this holds true and doesn't get any worse, um, we may have done some of the initial hard work of the reductions. And the question I have then is when do we actually start looking at slowly easing in the, some of the projects that we have put on hold? I think of everything from, you know, the public art program, they're not getting their, uh, the public art taken care of. That's a small amount of funding, but so, what is your anticipated schedule? Recognizing we've got moving targets, but when we might anticipate discussions around uh, adding some things that we pulled away back into the budget? That's a great question. And the way that I'm looking at this with our staff is the first um, item that I would like to put back in would be to reduce furlough because at this point in time, trying to get all of the work done um, with the additional work that's come from the, the constant change of the pandemic is extremely challenging. So the first thing that I would be recommending to council would be showing you that we have the revenue to go back and continue the expenditure on our staff. Um, so adding back in staff hours, so reducing the furlough. And then all of those items that were deferred will be coming back to council because we deferred them. So we put the money back into the fund balance. So each of those projects will be evaluated one by one. Um, and depending on what the funding source is and what the staff capacity is for implementing those projects and council's priorities for the projects, then we can start moving forward with that. Thank you. And, and one more question uh, along the line of anticipated expenses. Um, any sense of reopening of either the rec center or some of the um, scheduled youth programs and how that would affect our projected expenses and the timing of that. Again, to back uh, Councillor Baxter's um, question, how that would affect the cash flow going through, particularly in summer months. So um, I was going to speak a little bit about this on my manager report, but I'll do it now. Um, so we are looking at with the governor's draft guidance that was recently re released. We have until tomorrow at noon to provide public comment so the community can provide public, public comment on that guidance. And that guidance does include recreation center pools, outdoor activities, et cetera. And so what we're looking at is um, kids camp or our game time program to start that up. We'll be looking to start that up mid June to the end of June. So we'll be kicking off. We're, ask, we're going to be asking the community members to go onto the city's website on the recreation homepage and they can sign up for those programs. So anything that was the second session for the summer will start phasing in all of those programs um, per the guidance that is adopted and released with the next order um, from the governor, not from the city, but from the governor. 
So those will be rolling out. We're working in turn with um, finance and looking at the recreation programs are at least 90% cost recovery. And in my conversations with um, Kathy, we're moving forward to looking at how do we do 100% cost recovery on those programs so that it is running at 100%. At this point, the 90% is what was budgeted. So as we have revenues that come in for the programs, we're still balancing how many programs we open and how we open them. There may be an impact depending on how many, let's just use game time, for example, game time kids we can enroll with the certain numbers of um, counselors or uh, chaperones for those programs, childcare programs. Um, so we're still in process of looking at how do we ensure that we have that 90% cost recovery so that we can roll the program out and still hit our budget targets. Thank you, Amber. It's important to know that there uh, that the governor's uh, uh, draft order came out ye uh, yesterday and uh, we, there are two days of comments particularly important for the city of Durango is the, uh, well, it impacts the train as well as rafting companies and guide services. So as the river is uh, diminishing quickly, uh, we'd like to uh, uh, have, uh, it could be implemented as soon as uh, Friday, June 5th. That's not a given, that's a, that's a forecast that in fact, uh, the, the rafting companies might be able to open under with certain restrictions on, uh, and those are what are being debated right now, uh, on the 5th of, of uh, that that issue would, the order would be issued on the 5th of June. Dean, can I add one more item, please? Sure, sure. Um, so we have been receiving a number of phone calls related to playgrounds, and this just relates to the order. So the governor's draft guidance, I think it's critical to understand that it is draft, and at this point in time, per the Safer at Home, order, playgrounds are not open. However, the draft guidance states that playgrounds will be opened and the city is prepared and ready to take the caution tape off of those playgrounds and post new signage. At this point in time with the draft guidance, it says 10 kids can be playing on a play structure at one time. And so as soon as that final order drops, we'll change the signage whatever the order ends up being, it could be 10 or it could be something different. And then our playgrounds will open. So it's not the city closing the playgrounds because the city thinks the playgrounds should be closed. It's we're following the governor's guidance. We're excited to see this new order and we're excited to see that we're continuing to open up our economy and our community and our open space and our programs and our playgrounds. Um, and so as soon as that order is final, we'll be moving forward with opening up the play structures. Exactly. Thank you. And then uh, I think it's fair to say too, that uh, in our policy group meeting with the, uh, uh, where we reviewed the governor's order yesterday, uh, both uh, uh, Commissioner Lackalt with the La Plata County and myself were uh, uh, effectively going to lobby during this two day uh, review period to uh, make the rafting companies as least restrictive as possible. And so they can have the maximum amount of folks uh, on their boats uh, give it with, with appropriate social distancing and the other safety measures that have been uh, described statewide. So uh, that's, um, if there's anything else we think of between now and then too that uh, uh, is important for the city to know. There's confusion of what the city of Durango imposed. The only thing that the city of Durango has done is special is the mask ordinance that's uh, different than any other community in the state. Um, and uh, so, as was noted in public participation, there was some inaccuracies there relative to uh, what the city is doing versus all other communities. And it's hard to figure out. I don't, uh, I don't admonish any citizens for be, having incorrect information, but there is a, a lot of incorrect information out there We're trying to get you the right stuff. Uh, with that, we can move on to 5.2, which is a uh, street maintenance and CIP update. Good evening, Mayor, uh, members of Council. I'm Levi Lloyd, Director of City Operations. Uh, last week's study session, uh, Councilor Nesworthy had requested an update on streets maintenance and CIP projects, so I'm here to present that.
Okay, so uh, in 2020, year to date, uh, we've been doing, uh, the streets crews have been doing the typical maintenance that they do uh, in winter uh, as uh, conditions allow. We've patched 635 potholes uh, to May 1st, and May 1st we started with spring cleanup. Uh, crack ceiling, you can see we've done over 27,000 feet of linear feet of crack ceiling. And then during uh, spring cleanup, we picked up uh, approximately 4,740 cubic yards, which equates to about 474 um, dump truck loads of material. Uh, we mulched a considerable amount of material. Uh, we always uh, recycle. We have uh, community members that go in and take scrap metal uh, and recycle. They go through the piles and pull the uh, scrap metal out of that and recycle that. So a large portion of what goes out every year gets uh, recycled or mulched, and we give that mulch uh, to citizens uh, every year. We skip this year uh, due to COVID-19, but we will be uh, kicking that program off probably again next spring. Uh, so to move on to projects, the Thomas Avenue project uh, was bid and awarded. We awarded the project to DNL Construction out of Cortez, Colorado. Uh, this is a complete reconstruction of the street with the curb gutter and sidewalk, uh, storm sewer improvements, uh, reconstruction of the subgrade and the new asphalt paving surface. Uh, this is a $999,000 uh, project. They will be starting on Monday with the scheduled start date, and the completion date is scheduled for uh, November 27th, 2020. Uh, ADA ramp improvements. Uh, the, the, uh, this was awarded to SNS Construction. There's 33 total ADA ramps uh, in this project. Uh, it's a $118,000 project. 14 of those ramps were completed as of May 28th. And they are scheduled to be finished on July 20, or I'm sorry, July 17th of this year. Uh, street overlays, um, Four Corners Materials was the successful low bidder on street overlays. Uh, this is 25,000 square yards of overlays in five project areas. You can see them listed there. That's a $487,000 project. Uh, this is one project that has been deferred uh, temporarily until we can assess the uh, tax revenue declines from COVID-19. Um, we will reassess in July and tentatively look at uh, starting this project, issuing the notice of award and uh, notice to proceed in August of this year. Uh, if tax revenues rebound like we think they will. Uh, we've worked with Four Corners Materials on a number of uh, projects. Uh, they have agreed to hold their costs uh, until the end of the summer and expedite uh, these projects as we move forward with it we can award them. Uh, surface treatments, uh, HA5 is the seal coat. Um, this was awarded to Andel Construction, 31,000 square yards um, on nine streets, uh, mostly in the Twin Buttes area, $105,000 project. Uh, they are also scheduled to start on June uh, 8th, which is Monday, and they will be finished July 17th. Um, this company has done a fantastic job. Um, when they do this, they have to close down the street completely. So they are setting up shuttles for the citizens on those streets. Uh, they'll have masks, uh, hand sanitizer, and they'll be uh, limiting the number of people in the vans um, so that they can get people in and out of their homes and still accomplish their work. Uh, open graded friction course, so GFC is another service treatment. Uh, again, Four Corners Materials was a successful low bidder on this. It's 43,000 uh, square yards on Farida Road, and it's essentially from the roundabout at Riverview up to the light at uh, 250. Um, it's a $462,000 project. And again, this is a project that has been deferred um, based on the tax revenue decline of uh, COVID-19. We'll be looking at that again in July, uh, potentially awarding that in August or September of this year. Uh, street reconstructions. Again, I sound like a broken record, but uh, Four Corners Materials is a successful uh, low bidder on this. It's 25,000 square yards uh, in eight project areas. You can see the streets listed there. A uh, little over, uh, just under, I'm sorry, it's $1.1 million project cost. Uh, again, deferred. We'll be assessing this and awarding this uh, hopefully in August if uh, sales tax revenues continue to increase. Uh, alley paving. Uh, our initial bids came in uh, significantly over budget. We had $100,000 in the budget. The bids came in at $191,000. We have reduced the uh, scope of the project, uh, and the rebid of that project is scheduled to open on June 23rd. 
Um, this is a project that we had initially identified as a reduction um, based on uh, the economic conditions, but we will uh, assess this with the other projects as we move forward. Any questions on any of that? Thank you. Thank you, Levi. Can you give us again um, the dollar total for the, the three projects that are confirmed and underway, the Thompson, the ADA ramps, and I, I think the third one was the surface treatments? Uh, so I, have, I have a question follow-up to that. Yeah, so Thomas Avenue is uh, just under a million. It's 999000 um, The ADA projects is $118,000. Uh, the HA5 seal code treatment is a hundred and five thousand dollars, and those are the projects that we have awarded to date. Um, and then the other projects, uh, not to uh, just under two million, uh, just under two million dollars, I believe, uh, that we'll be reassessing in August. So, so my question is. I believe, you know, we collected tax starting in July of 2019 through that year. And I think that was something like 2 million just to start with in the bank. So I guess I'm wondering if we had 2 million to start with and we're still coming in, um, we seem to not be spending as much as we had available to, to actually address some of these urgent problems. Uh, so we, the, uh, that two million is going toward the uh, Thomas project, the ADA ramps, uh, and the HA5. And then uh, we will, the next projects up as, as we see where the, that tax revenue is uh, here in the next couple of weeks. Um, next up, we would look at reconstructions because those take a little bit more time. So those would be the next streets that we would award. So if the tax revenue shows um, positive trends and we have the, the the money in the bank now we would award those we don't have to wait until august so we're we're assessing on a continual basis to see uh, when we can start awarding some of these projects and i would suggest to, to to you and amber that as i asked earlier when can we start releasing some of those that have been pulled back eight hundred thousand dollars sitting in the bank with streets not being fixed and putting people to work in the community could be um, a very important uh, investment and uh, obligation that we have committed to the people of the community. So thank you. I appreciate um, the prudence, but I also just want to make certain we're using that money to get those roads fixed uh, sooner. So thank you. Uh, any other comments for Levi? Yeah. I, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, Levi, I was wondering if the spring cleanup was larger this year than in the past or smaller or? Uh, I was, it was actually on par with uh, what we'd seen. We, <clears throat> the first couple of weeks we actually anticipated, we kind of projected that it was going to be larger than it had been the previous year. Uh, but the last week or so, there wasn't quite as much material out as we had anticipated. And I think uh, some of that is due to the urban scavenging that happens. People taking metal and things of that nature out. We see big piles and then when we show up, um, people have gone in and taken a lot of the stuff that's in them. So, uh, but last year, just as a, an example, last year we did uh, roughly 5,100 cubic yards. Um, so we were just, you know, a couple hundred cubic yards under what we have done traditionally. And, and spring cleanup is usually um, in the high 4,000, low uh, 5,000 uh, cubic yard. Thank you. And Lee, I have one more question. Were you also, as part of your report, going to give us an update on the administration building in the Vactor Garage? Up oh, next. That's next? Uh, okay. Jared, yeah, Jared is gonna give that next. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, we have item 5.3 on the agenda, which is an update regarding the Utilities Administration Building, which is, uh, for our citizens out there, the last component of the uh, uh, wastewater treatment facility. You'll see it under construction uh, uh, near where the old Chamber of Commerce used to be. So, uh, Jared. Um, good evening, Mayor Brookie and uh, councilors. I am here, um, a poor stand in for Greg Boyson, um, but um, we'll be giving you the update on uh, what's happening down with the admin building. So, I went ahead and PDF'd this thing. Um, there we are. 
All right. So can everybody see that screen? All right. Um, again, my my appreciation goes out to Greg Boyce, and he's doing great work on this site, uh, among many other things, uh, and continues to be um, kind of linchpin of keeping these projects running um, and being a great project manager. So I just want to give that shout out. But um, so just uh, if you have not been down on the site recently, um, you can see some of the pictures we have here. Um, the main entrance from Santa Rita Park is really starting to come together. Um, you can kind of see that in the center picture here. Um, that's going to be kind of the walk in right from Santa Rita Park. And then you see the portico and the public restrooms. Um, and that's over on the trail side. Um, that is, is currently they're kind of getting that to grade. Uh, they're doing the rock facade and, and moving that forward. Um, so some additional pictures. Um, you can see that that uh, you can tell Greg helped me with this presentation because I wouldn't use a word like wainscot. Um, but you can see the uh, brick wainscot they're putting in along the wall. Um, and we've also been engaging with the uh, you know, Durango Botanical Society to talk about um, how the landscaping plan is going to move forward as well. So um, we're kind of trying to plan uh, both for the future of this um, and getting this project done uh, as we move through the fall. Um, you see this, uh, if you keep going down the river trail, you, you get to see the brick facade. It's the same brick facade from the same quarry um, that was used for all the stone facades in the whole, um, in the whole project. So uh, it's all designed to be the same. Um, and uh, of course it was originally bid together. Um, uh, but again, it's it's going really well. We've been very happy with uh, Jane's efforts and the work, and and they've been um, continuing that work uh, without much hang up. Um, here you can start. You can see a couple pictures from that second floor, um, so you can start to see where the office spaces will be. Um, looking out, um, and actually the the second the center photo here. Um, to the very corner of that, um, that's where there will be a, a second floor patio that overlooks the, the Animus River there. Um, and and we, they are actually starting to put in, hang some sheetrock now, so they're starting to get enclosure. Um, there's a little bit of steel placement that continues, um, but they, they may be enclosed uh, in the next few weeks, which is, um, you know, again, great, great work, Jane's. It's a testament to the effort they've put into it. Um, and this picture is of the Vactor Garage. Again, this is kind of back uh, in the middle of the site, uh, immediately adjacent to the Headworks building. Um, and so they are, um, you know, they've erected the cast in place forms uh, for concrete, um, they'll be placing those walls in the next week or so. Uh, and uh, you'll see that building really start to move ahead. Behind those cast in, uh, cast in place forms, uh, they've already done some uh, concrete block work. Um, and so it, it continues to proceed. Uh, again, both of these, uh, we had originally had the, um, the admin building moving ahead. Um, we put the back to garage into the project after uh, the city council adopted the budget in December. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and so uh, they, they both are moving ahead and they both still maintain that uh, deadline of the 3rd of December for completion. Um, and I, I had provided some of this information to Devin, I think two weeks ago, or, or maybe she had presented it last week. Um, but kind of the, the budget summary. Um, so overall, we have uh, you know $9.6 million in, in contracted cost. Um, other things like geotech, plan review, furnishings, and uh, additional excavation uh, for the sum total of $9.9 .9 million. Um, to date, uh, $4.6 million has been spent. So we are at about 47% of the project spent. Um, and we are at um, a little over uh, 50, almost 60% of our timeline um, is gone. So we have 184 days left. 
uh, in my discussions with Greg and in our in the weekly meetings that are conducted with Jane's, um, they they are moving at a really great speed, um, and uh, so they expect to be done potentially in October. Um, but I'm not going to hold my breath for that. I'm I'm just going to keep looking at the 12-3 date. So, um, Jerry, can I ask you a quick question, if I may? Sure. I thought the administration building was going to cost eight million dollars. And the back to garage was going to cost $1 million. So it seems like it's 10% above what I believe were the CIP approved projects. Can you help me out with that? So the, the CIP approved projects were, um, and, and again, I'm, I'm giving you everything here. Um, if we just talk about construction, that would just be the Jane's cost of 8.3, uh, but we had already appropriated uh, $350,000 for the design costs um, prior to the 20, um, 2019 budget. Um, so uh, again, I'm giving you total project cost that includes the appropriation made in September for design, uh, and that was September of 2018. Um, the 2019 budget number, the 2020 budget number as well. So. All, you know, I'm giving you all of those numbers together instead of one of those or, or any, any particular one of those costs. Um, and you see that Jane's actual construction cost is 8.3 million. Um, and you see that um, change order number two there, um, the Vactor Garage, that, that is that part of the project, that's $929,000. So. Barbara, I think I might have a response to your question. Um, the previous city manager did make an administrative change approval to take, I believe it was $700,000 from previously appropriated projects to put towards um, the admin building. Jared, is the, am I missing something or can you expand it on that? Because I think that may be part of um, the question, the response to the question that Barbara's asking. And before you do respond, Jared, I'd like to know at a $700,000 reappropriation from something the city council had appropriated, when did that come back to city council for discussion? So, so just to answer that question, yes, there was, um, I, I believe in September of uh, 2019, um, Ron had uh, had, I believe, come to council or mentioned it to council that he um, he was going to move some money uh, or do some project sweeps. We we swept. Um, I've got project numbers here. Um, you know, it was the last dollars from projects 1044, 1078, uh, 1100. Uh, 1067 and 2031 um, to make that difference. And, and the total was $777,000. Um, so thank you, Jared. I, I'm just for council saying that I believe we're supposed to talk about the CIP project and the process next week at our meeting. And I think this is maybe a good example because I'd certainly like to uh, know that it was a robust discussion and city council actually approved a reallocation of this sum. So, you know, I, I understand it's already good. The, the course has left the barn, but I uh, am concerned about as an appropriation of that size being fully discussed and, and determined. Thank but, you, but thank you for follow-up. And, and Amber, I'll look forward to it when we have the discussion on the CIP um, best practices and recommended policies. My, my recollection was there was a transfer from projects that uh, were either not completed or under budget that had previously been allocated by council. And um, so these were not, um, you know, it wasn't, uh, I wouldn't use the term swept if they were just uh, applied to this project to uh, facilitate its uh, completion. So, uh, but uh, yeah, we, I'd be anxious to see any uh, tracking of that information so that the public doesn't think that uh, this didn't get discussed. Um, and I think that Councillor Noseworthy's um, comment is that um, I believe that we've been discussing that best practices uh, would have 
allowed for that switch to come to city council's approval since it had been already approved for a different kind of project. So I agree that this is one of our policy conversations we need well, to take. I, I think we might find it in the minutes actually. So um, is what I'm saying. So well, and perhaps we could just get an update next week when we talk about it and clarify, answer questions and put it on the table for future policy discussions because we've all suggested we want to do that. So we may need to readdress some exactly. of that. Exactly. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I'd like to, I understand uh, Chief Bramer has uh, a few words for us this evening. Um, short presentation by Chief. Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor and Councilors. I'd like to take this opportunity to speak on behalf of our officers and staff. Today we took a picture in front of the police department which I would like to share as I speak. Our nation is tearing itself apart. I witnessed an amazing sight earlier this week. Many members of our community united, united in a peaceful assembly to express their pain and frustration. The pain and frustration we at the Durango Police Department also share. I cannot rightfully claim to know the level of pain in each of our communities. I can only empathize. Institutional racism and discrimination continue to permeate our society, and Durango is not immune. The only way to address injustice is to understand the issue and take action. On both Friday and again on Saturday, we heard our community. I commend everyone who participated in these emotional events. By expressing your First Amendment rights in a peaceful manner was a powerful statement. We at the Durango Police Department want to continue to support all members of our community. We want to cooperate with every member of our diverse community, to provide all a safe space and platform to be heard, to express your voice. We are not your enemy. Our power is derived from the people. We police our community to the power provided by the people. We need, we must partner with key members of our community better understand your needs, to adopt strategies, promote social harmony, increase awareness, and accept diversity. We have started discussions with both Fort Lewis College and the city's Community Relations Commission, post listening sessions in the near future. As your chief of police, I made a commitment to be a leader. I took an oath to uphold the law with equality to all. Let us work together and thank you. Mayor, City Council, thank you for allowing me to share this time. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, um, and I, I hope uh, hope we can get that picture on the front page of the Herald. That's uh, very powerful, and uh, thank you for uh, having extreme restraint and uh, and the great training and and, and uh, uh, everything from. Uh, de-escalation training to transgender 101 as I understand there is a course for it so that uh, our police department uh, has uh, uh, taken to uh, ensure inclusivity and uh, and uh, fair law enforcement in our community thank you for that statement appreciate it and I hope uh, we can do our part as citizens thanks can I just th say thank you too I just want to send my sincerest thanks to Chief Brammer uh, for taking the time to talk with our community and to address our community during this extremely important time and to for all of our Durango police officers and staff um, for working um, so hard to 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 be a community a safe community with fair and equal treatment and and I appreciate it I appreciate your efforts and I appreciate you taking a stance and uh, speaking with us today thank you so much Thank you. And I'd just like to add in, um, I observed both uh, two weeks ago, Friday, the um, anti or uh, opposed to the mask march, and then also on Saturday, the uh, demonstration uh, for racial justice and justice. And both of them were civil, um, respectful, and I noticed the police uh, participation at both of them. And I, I thank you for that. And I thank the community for exercising your rights to uh, be critical and to have differences and to do it in a um, very respectful civil manner. Thank you.
And I'll also add there'll be another vigil Friday night, this coming Friday night at uh, Buckley Park at 7 p.m. And I'd, I'd like to say that I believe that your police force under your guidance, uh, this is their standard behavior, good behavior and re treating people with respect um, and that you're not changing just because of the situation, that this is how you are and this is how you behave with our community. And I really appreciate that. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Councillors, for weighing in. Uh, if Chris were here, he'd make it unanimous, I know. So uh, so thank you for that. Uh, whew. Well, with that, uh, we're on to the consent agenda, uh, item seven on our uh, published agenda. And uh, the consent agenda is intended to allow the City Council by a single motion to approve matters that are considered routine or non-controversial. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member requests that an item be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Items removed from the consent agenda will be considered under agenda item eight. Uh, so uh, let's have a reading. First, we'll have a reading of the consent agenda and then I'll ask for items to be removed. And we can't hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. Item 6.1 is approval of minutes from the study session from May 12th, 2020. Item 6.2 and 6.3 are discussion of possible action. And item 6.2 concerns a resolution regarding the reduction in council compensation in accordance with citywide employee furloughs. That's resolution 2020-14. Item 6.3 concerns the submission of an administrative planning grant application to support an electric vehicle readiness plan. Item 6.4 and 6.5 are requests for a public hearing. 6.4 is to consider an ordinance authorizing the conveyance of one half interest in city owned property known as tract A3 of McGraw or of McCaw subdivision number one, project number 91-142 at 820 Airport Road to La Plata County with the date of June 16th, 2020. And that ordinance would be 2020-04. And then lastly, item 6.5 is a request for a public hearing to consider an ordinance amending Tabor emergency reserves with the date of June 16th, 2020 and that's ordinance 2020-05. Thank you, Ben. Um, do we uh, have any uh, items that would councilors would like to remove this evening? Uh, yes, Dean, uh, Mayor Brookie. Um, I'm not used to saying that. <laughs> it doesn't flow yet. Yeah, I'm still uh, I'd like to remove 6.5, please. Thank you. And I'd like to, I have a few questions on item 6.3. Excellent. So I'm understanding that we have, we'd like to retract uh, 6.3 and 6.5. And uh, in which case I'd ask for a motion to approve 6.1, 6.2 and 6.4 of the consent agenda this evening. So moved. All seconds. It's been moved and seconded. May we have a roll call please. Councilor Yusuf. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Baxter? Yes. And then Councillor Noseworthy? Yes. And Mayor Brickey? Yes. Thank you so much. Now, uh, if we can have a little discussion on 6.3, the electric vehicle readiness plan. Good evening, Councillors. Kevin Hall, uh, yes. Assistant City Manager. I'm here to answer any questions you might have regarding that item. Councilor Nosworthy? Yes, thank you, Kevin. I, I have, um, I think, two questions. Um, it says that the energy audit, you know, you'll be hiring a consultant to develop a strategic plan, and we lay that out for the electrical vehicle. And I know that in the past, I think it was Four Core did some work on the, the conversion of our fleet. And so first was, will you be, I have three questions. And first, will you be building on that work as part of the, um, any consulting work that we're doing so that we're not starting from scratch. And in the effort to 
shop local will there be an emphasis on working with a local nonprofit that might have expertise or consultant an independent contractor as well but a nonprofit or independent that would have expertise in that and then my last question related to it is the timing um, you talk about starting it in the summer and having a, available in by the end of 2020 but my concern would be to have that information available in a, such a timely manner that we can incorporate it into the planning for the 2021 budget. So those are my three um, questions and topics to raise. Sure. Uh, there is a little confusion on this agenda doc where it does reference an energy performance contract. That isn't what this is. Uh, that's just a typo. Uh, this is really a standard planning, uh, uh, planning process that uh, you can see we have a number of leveraged opportunities for funding here. Uh, in terms of Forecore and the work they did, uh, have done, we most certainly will include that. Uh, one of the earliest components of this project would be uh, kind of community context and stakeholders. So uh, as with any good planning project, you kind of put your feelers out and ask what has already been done, what's relevant to what we're doing, and how can we harness the work that's been done already. Uh, Forecore, is my understanding, never uh, completed the full kind of fleet analysis, uh, vehicle analysis that they are doing in the community for a variety of reasons I'm not entirely clear on, but the work didn't get done. Um, however, we will work with Forecore as well as the other stakeholders. We have a very close partnership with LPEA, as you can see in the agenda doc. Uh, they'll be a partner in this as well. Um, as for um, who will do the work, uh, once we have secured the funding, we're able to put out an issue an RFP and see who's interested in or capable of doing that work. There'll be some minimum qualifications required of whomever. Uh, we do not limit it to local companies. Our purchasing process does have some um, uh, preference for uh, local and state um, contractors, but it doesn't allow us to necessarily keep it local unless there's a compelling reason in it. And quite frankly, is the best of the proposals that come in. So time will tell on that one. And then as for a schedule, you know, it's unfortunate it's playing out the way it is. As you know, we kind of went into a bit of a slowdown here a few months ago with, for a variety of uh, reasons, COVID being certainly the primary one. Uh, you know, we will try to move this along as, as ex expeditiously as possible, but I think we will be learning a lot along the way that may inform some actions that can occur before the plan is officially stamped, approved, uh, you know, we have been doing fleet analysis and uh, looking at uh, opportunities for electric vehicles for some time. So it's not like we're starting from scratch here, but what we are trying to do is put together more of a comprehensive community-wide view of things. So, uh, you know, if we can come up with some uh, good direction early on, that would be fabulous. But until we move into the process, I just don't know where we will be at that point. Kevin, it's, I, I mean, as I read it, I mean, what what the topic of this agenda item is is uh, just simply a letter uh, from the mayor to uh, Dola uh, uh, Patrick Rondinelli of, of Department of Local Affairs to obtain a twenty five thousand dollar grant to accomplish this. So uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I you know I, I'm anxious to uh, see how this rolls out, but uh, who with the who and how of this is not. Uh, of urgency at this moment until we get the money, I guess. And so what the uh, action taken on this would simply allow uh, uh, me to sign this letter of request from DOLA for a $25,000 grant to address this topic. Uh, so if there is support for doing so, we'll uh, put it on uh, the, the proper letterhead, get it dated correctly, and then uh, find its way to the mayor for signature if there's support. And can you remind us of when the decision will be made on the proposal that would be submitted? Well, on the on the grant application or yes, the, on the twenty five thousand dollar request. Well, what's interesting with uh, we have a great relationship with Department of Local Affairs administrative planning grants. If there's funding available and it meets the criteria, they move very quickly. So, quite frankly, once we submit this, we we've already talked to Patrick Rondinelli, and I'm not going to say that. Uh, we have the funding uh, awarded to us yet because we don't. We had to do the formal submittal, but he was very supportive of the project. And this project is uh, one of those classic ones where you have such great leverage and partnerships. 
the city's total participation in this looks to be, you know, less than 10 to 15 percent right in there of the total project cost. So it's one that Patrick very was very supportive of. And I thank you for the work. I support it uh, when we get ready to come up for our, the, whatever vote, but I totally support it. My main goal is if we can get a thorough uh, report, but also incorporate it into our planning for next year's budget. I, I think that's extremely important to start addressing the fleet conversion. Thank you. Any other discussion? Questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion. I'll I'll recommend um, approve and authorize the submission of an application to the Colorado Department of Local Affairs Administrative Planning Grant Program to support a, an electric vehicle readiness plan. I'll second. Been moved and seconded. May I have a roll call, please? Councilor Yusuf. Yes. Councilor Noseworthy. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Baxter? Yes. And Mayor Bricky? Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good discussion. Uh, our next item was 6.5, a request for public hearing to consider an ordinance amending Tabor emergency reserves. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, we all know that this is just a, uh, a request to put this on a, a, the city council agenda for two weeks from now. Uh, so I'd like to reserve any uh, item, any discussion that would be considered a public hearing uh, for that date, but uh, uh, be happy to have staff answer any other questions regarding the, uh, the need for this topic on our agenda. Uh, so I was hoping that Dirk could give a, just a very, very brief overview of it um, because it's something unusual. It's not been done by us before. Um, and then I just had one or two points after that that I'd like to make. Uh, I think if if, uh, yeah, if we need to update on the process, we should have uh, uh, Dirk Nelson ask talk about the, the need for this to be posted two weeks prior to an actual public hearing, and then we are it would become a topic of our uh, of our council hearing. It would become a hearing item in two weeks, but. Uh, um, I understand what you're saying, Dean, but it is on our agenda and there's documentation for it. And I just thought a very brief um, discussion of it by the city attorney might be helpful for the public so that they're informed about where we're going and what we might be doing. It's just a very unique situation under this emergency ordinance that we're under. Sure, sure. Uh, Dirk, are you available to comment on that? And, and uh... I, I am, I hope you can hear me. Um... I can hear you fine. So yes, this um, this process came out of a sort of front to back analysis of all of the funds that might uh, be reviewed when we were looking for a response to the COVID crisis. And um, I had a discussion with Dee Weiser, who is the city's uh, special bond council uh, some time ago. And I think Councilor Baxter actually also raised this idea uh, it's at a study session, as I recall, about uh, undertaking a review about the city's uh, Tabor uh, reserves. As you know, uh, Tabor, um, one of its provisions requires all uh, local governments to budget 3% of its um, sort of general fund revenues for a uh, emergency reserve. Unfortunately, the language of Tabor uh, very much restricts the ability of cities or any local government for that matter to use those Tabor emergency reserves to pay for anything other than the direct expenses associated with the emergency. So that means that the city really cannot, uh, in these opinion, use uh, Tabor reserve funds to make up revenue shortfalls which is, has been in the last couple of significant emergencies the city has faced, that being 416 fire and this emergency, uh, that those kinds of losses actually are the bulk of the impacts on the city. So one of the ideas is to uh, take a city asset and it's focusing primarily, or this proposal is focusing primarily on 
using a real estate asset to pledge uh, for the emergency reserve, it would have to be valued at an amount equal to the reserve requirement. That reserve requirement is approximately $1.3 million, I believe, in the 2020 budget. So it will be necessary to try to find an asset that's appropriate, that's valued appropriately, that's uh, reasonably liquid. Um, it doesn't have to be just one asset. It could be a variety of smaller assets might be appropriate. Uh, it could also be used in combination with some cash uh, to make up the Tabor Reserve. But the effect of that would be to allow council to uh, reappropriate the roughly 1.3, assuming we replace all of it with an asset for any other purpose, including the creation of an emergency reserve that could be used for broader purposes than those allowed uh, under Tabor. So again, this is a, this is set for or, or requesting a hearing uh, to discuss all these items in depth. It would require an addition to the code, city code. So therefore, we need a, we need the um, hearing and uh, uh, moving in authorization to move forward to create an ordinance uh, to make that uh, be effective. The, this process and this technique is used uh, by the state of Colorado and has been for many many years. Uh, City and County of Denver, I know, does it. Uh, I think they use a, a combination of assets, real estate assets and cash. I think likewise, the state does the same thing. School districts uh, are authorized also to do this and many, many of the school districts have done it because they are, school districts of course are very um, real estate uh, intensive organizations and uh, it frees up cash for them to use. So. Um, that's the idea, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have other questions. That sounded great, Dirk. Thank you very much. Uh, the two points that I wanted to make were that the major um, benefit of this is, a, is it allows more flexibility under times of emergency and stress like we're under now. And the other thing I wanted to say is it doesn't require us to do this. It just no. gives the capability should we decide to. And so that's really the benefit of, of the situation. Sure, and, and and again, one of the discussion items will be in two weeks, um, you know, how that decision is made. And you're right, it, it, and I think that decision about how to what assets to use in the emergency reserve could be made on an annual basis um, it, as part of the budget. Uh, I, I was thinking this year because it would be a little out of the budget cycle is that we would perhaps authorize. Uh, as part of this year that we would go ahead and uh, potentially pledge an asset for that purpose in 2020. And then uh, as part of the 21 budget, uh, reassess that in terms of whether you wanted, you know, what sort of asset you want to designate at that point. That that was just my thinking. And I think that's reflected in the agenda doc. Yeah, and I would also say that uh, to that point, that in reality, we need to have a better assessment of financially where we are and where we think we're going before we make those decisions. And it, for me, anyway, it seems like it's more event uh, motivated versus budget cycle uh, motivated. So if because you can't forecast, for example, we didn't that we'd have the coronavirus, so we we wouldn't have in 2019 been able to really make a, an assumption based on this. Whereas now, and as we go into the future with better numbers, then we can. Right. Good point. Yes. Thank you. I have a question for you as well, um, Dirk. And if you can't answer it now, I, I wanted to throw it out there so we could could answer it in uh, two weeks. And that is, you know, we've been grappling with when do we pull back the state of emergency that we're under right now and actually start working to our next phase. And so I also, but I do see to Councillor Baxter's point that the merit of having this available as an option. So my question would be, uh, if I understand that we have to be in a state of emergency when you initiate the action, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be combined in a, a, a state of emergency for the whole period of time that you may be using these resources. So I'd like the, a little more specific information around the start time for this and how that would impact our ability to go away from a state, a declared state of emergency. Okay, well, the, you know, I think um, the, the use of the emergency funds uh, under TABOR are tied to, um, actually there's, a, there's about one short sentence in TABOR that addresses this, 
but it does require that it be used for a declared emergency. So um, if you're going to use the taper funds, uh, again, th there would have to be a declared emergency and then it could be used in response to that emergency. So I, I don't know that it necessarily has to be a declared emergency for the entire time the funds are going to be used. But in this case, uh, in our case, current case, uh, we really aren't looking to use those funds again, because I think they're limited under paper on how they can be used. Mm. Uh, so just to be clear, um, the idea would be that an asset would be pledged uh, to the emergency reserve, keeping in mind that the use of those emergency reserves is, is very limited. And uh, Tabor was adopted in 93, I believe. So there's never been any use of uh, emergency funds in the city of Durango. And I'm not aware, I asked these point blank if he was aware if even cities on the front range, for instance, when there were the massive floods a few years back, if any of them used those emergency reserves for that. And he was not aware uh, of anyone who had done that simply because the limitations are so strict that people haven't done it. So I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I think to do the process that we're talking about would not require a declared emergency. This would just be an effort to change the kind of assets that we allocate for the emergency reserves. And then the second question, which I think is, is what you're asking, if I'm not misunderstanding, is that how then would you access those emergency table reserves uh, if we needed them? And that would require an emergency declaration. Uh, those funds would have to be repaid, uh, replenished if they're used, uh, basically by the end of the next budget cycle. That's what our, also our city code says. So we can certainly discuss all of that uh, in two weeks, those kind of details. So I hope I answered your question. Um, you helped a, a little bit, but I'd still like clarification for when we might, and this is a discussion for next week or, or in the following weeks, when we might go out of a state of emergency and into our next phase of what we're gonna do with the recovery of this um, in this situation. So I, if I understand you correctly, we've already had the emergency. So we might have an option to, to leverage these, these funds um, but with, it doesn't preclude us from actually possibly going out of a declared state of emergency. I think that's absolutely right. I think the, the action that's contemplated in the agenda documentation in terms of substituting a, a real estate asset for cash uh, would really have nothing to do, it wouldn't be limited in any way uh, by the current declaration. This could be done at any time. And I think to um, Councilor Baxter's point, and I think that was maybe part of her point was that um, that could be done really at any time uh, if you wanted to do that. And then, in the effect of it, would be would free up those funds, and the, and the council then would be free to designate the use of those funds, all or part of which you might want to keep for again a more flexible emergency reserve. It makes sense. Um, and if you could, Dirk, um, uh, Mr. Nelson, sorry, it went in uh, for our agenda doc next week or when we have this on for our next city council study session for the public hearing time or whenever it is the council will have been reviewing it. If we could get, you know, more information on since it doesn't sound like a very, it sounds like a relative, it sounds like it's done by the school boards and it's been done um, up in Denver. But if you could make, if we could make sure we look at other communities, um, why they may or may have not considered or done this type of substitution, um, what it impacts, if it impacts bonding capacity and, and what, so in what, in what matter, just, we just need to understand all the details behind it before um, we can in, intelligently talk about it, I think. Sure. Yeah. And I did ask D Weiser those questions and, and he actually, was very supportive of the idea um, in terms of, he thought it made a lot of sense uh, in our case to do that. So I will also, I will be prepared to discuss that uh, further and hopefully be able to answer any questions that come up in two weeks. Thank you. I may at least, try to, and I may in this case, try to rough out an ordinance that would be available. They're not always available at the hearing, but I think in this case, that would I very well may, my intention is, to have an ordinance roughed out and have the uh, review it perhaps even in advance of that hearing. So, the, and just and I'll speak of timing a little bit here. Uh, if we just use the normal course of events, uh, we should be able to have uh, something like this, assuming council wants to adopt it, uh, be in effect.
probably by the end of July, which I think coincides with, you know, some by then uh, we may have a little better feel for where we stand with the uh, budget shortfalls and so forth. Exactly. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, with that, uh, uh, any other questions or should I ask for a motion? Ask for a motion. I'll make one. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Baxter. I uh, make a motion to set a public hearing for June 16th, 2020 to take public comment on an ordinance to amend the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango, Colorado to provide for the option of using real property owned by the city to serve as all or part of the emergency reserve required by Tabor. Second. It's been moved and seconded. May we have a roll call, please? Councilor Noseworthy? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Baxter? Yes. Councilor Yusuf? Yes. And Mayor Brookie? Yes. And I'm looking forward to anything that we can divert money away from uh, Tabor, <laughs> Tabor funds and uh, pledge other assets is, a, is sounds like a good idea to me. And we'll look forward to a uh, discussion in a couple weeks. Uh, with that, we move on to uh, the uh, public hearing segments. Uh, item nine, we have no public hearings this evening, not legislative or quasi-judicial. So, uh, and we have no other uh, thoughts from the uh, city attorney. Uh, I'll, let ask Dirk if one more time if he has any other items he wants to bring before us, but there are no nothing on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and we have no introduction of ordinances this evening. Uh, so that takes us to item 12 on our, our agenda, which is administrative uh, with the city update by uh, interim city manager Amber Blake. Good evening, Mayor Brookie and members of the city council. Um, this evening, I have a few items on the city update for you. I'd like to begin with an update on the mask order. And we received questions about um, how the public health order is going and what the related calls are. So first related to the mask order, um, Mr. Hall, Kevin had a conversation last week with Mr. Watson, who's the owner of a nature's oasis. and. He informed him that we would have this uh, relay his displeasure with the lack of emphasis on enforcement. And that would mean strict enforcement rather than the voluntary compliance and education that the city is currently seeking. He feels that the enforcement has been left to the business operators with no support from the city. And while he is seeing significant compliance at his store, which again is nature's oasis, those few who choose not to wear a face covering are often confrontational and threaten legal action. So he further indicated that the order should be enforced by the city, rescinded or shortened. So this is just feedback to the council that uh, the city manager's office received. Um, and then this evening I have the last two weeks. So from 519 to 62, the update on the public health order. We had 211 public health order related calls. And of those calls, 17 were reported through online reporting and 188 of them were officer initiated checks of businesses or contacts with individuals throughout the city. Six of them were dispatched through our dispatch center and 18 of those contacts ended with DPD giving a verbal warning for the public health order violation. There was one written warning, nine of the complaints turned out to be unfounded and 173 were cleared as citizen assists. Um, so this is where we are with the enforcement of the public health orders. The next item that I wanted to discuss with council or report on was the draft guidance from the governor. I'd like to make sure that the community knows that they can go to the state of Colorado's webpage at covid19.colorado.gov. And that's where you as a citizen can input your feedback related to this upcoming guidance. Again, that's only open until noon tomorrow. So there's um, places of worship draft, draft guidance, personal recreation draft guidance. This is for pools, parks, gyms, rec centers, and organized sports. And then outdoor industry draft guidance. So those are the three areas. And again, that's due tomorrow by noon. And there may be amendments based on stakeholder feedback. Um, and then 
The next item that I have um, is the city of Durango. I mentioned this earlier, but for those individuals that are watching and may have missed, playgrounds will be opening based on the guidance from the governor that we're hoping to see this week, the final guidance. And we will then be rolling out game time for child care this summer, as well as our other summer programs, and then the recreation center, all based on that guidance from the governor. Um, this next item that I have to report on was a key discussion item that the council had last week at the study session related to changes for Main Avenue, related to opening some of the public right of way for retail and business and restaurant use. City staff has been working very closely with bid and all the and stakeholders over the past week to secure more space for businesses within the city right of way. And I wanted to make sure that it's very clear that all of our stakeholders and bid and city staff are in agreement that any plan that's put forward has to be safe, has to be safe, functional, supported by the majority of business owners, embraced by the bid. And when I say safe, we're looking at ADA compliance. We're ma making sure that it's safe for both active um, shopping, eating, dining, whatever it is in that public space, as well as for vehicles. So pedestrians, cyclists, drivers, um, and that's going to be a change. So the plan of attack right now is that we have the road diet, which would take four travel lanes down to two, one in each direction, plus a center turn lane. And this would run from approximately College Drive to 13th Street. Um, we are working with CDOT and will coordinate on adjustments for the signals. And then the bump outs, which are platforms that would then be at the same level as the sidewalk, we're looking at using approximately 60 parking spaces and several additional feet of vacated travel lane to create approximately 12 areas for additional commerce. And this would require road being repainted and signal modifications. And staff is comfortable with this. Um, the park and parking vacancy rate downtown is high and currently there's ample parking in the vicinity. We also have the parking lots on East 2nd Avenue as well as the transit center lot. And we're working with the 9R school district um, to see if we can use parking in their parking area up at the administration building at the end of East 2nd. And then after 5 p.m., we've had conversations with the county and the parking lots um, where both near the Schluter building as well as the additional lot are available for public parking after 5 p.m. Um, so that can also help assist with that loss of parking in downtown or shift of that space. The bid and business support, there was a survey that was sent out to 341 contacts by the bid and for businesses in the Central Business District. And this includes East 2nd Avenue, as well as cross streets, town plaza, businesses along Camino del Rio, as long as and along Main Avenue. Um, and 106 responses were received. That's a 31% response rate. And of that 31% response rate or those 106 responses, 77% or 82 votes were in favor and 23% or 24 votes were not in favor. Um, and Tim Walsworth sent us over that information this afternoon. Um, we're working on an additional emergency order to use the right of way. So that's one of the items that we're working on this week. And we're also looking at the budget and cost share between the city bid and CDOT. And that's still being worked out. Um, in addition to this, there's permitting that will be required. And we're streamlining the bistro permit program to permit businesses to use space and we're waiving that fee. And until the area is ready for use, bistros will be allowed to expand on the sidewalk as long as they meet that ADA compliance for the pedestrian clear zone, and that's maintained. Um, the next hurdle that we have to overcome is the state liquor licensing, which is a separate process. So we're working through that as well. And we're looking to roll this out in June. And I think the key thing is I'm gonna go back to safety and making sure that we do this right. There's, it's a lot of change at once. Um, and so it will be implementation um, at some point this month, but not this week. <laughs> 
And then the next phase of this would be to expand into other areas. Um, so that's my update on those pieces. I'd like to let you know that we're continuing the utility bill late fee waiver um, and avoiding the shutoffs and we're still allowing payment plans. So any of our community members out there needing to set up a payment plan for your city utility bill, please contact the city at 375-5000. And then we'll be still continuing our um, virtual meetings at this point through July 15th. And finally, my last note is that um, the city has been in conversation with the 9R school district. As we continue to open the community, um, child care is definitely an issue that is that many families are facing. So the 9R school district will be continuing their kids camp program and families can sign up for child care on the kids camp program. It's the 9R website and under child care and you can sign up under that. There are a number of spaces that are available and they'll be running that through June. And then with the new order from the governor, the city will also be rolling out and starting to ramp up our program for game time. And that's another childcare opportunity. And then Boys and Girls Club is also ramping up their childcare program this summer. Um, not all of this is directly related to what the city does, but it does impact all of our community members. So I wanted to make sure to take the opportunity to inform our community of the options for childcare that are opening up in our community. And that's what I have this evening. Thank you, Amber. And, and thanks for uh, that update on the, being a mother yourself. You're uh, definitely on top of that. And that was the topic of our uh, executive meeting the other day with the uh, 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 Dan Snowberger and folks that uh, he was really wanting us to help him promote that program. And, and uh, it's good to know, previously stated earlier in the meeting that uh, we quite possibly, the city of Durango might be opening up the second, uh, the second round of uh, activities for our recreation program this summer. So we can, it's not a for sure, but that's uh, certainly on the horizon. All these would be in compliance for those parents out there that are concerned about enrolling your kids in these programs that would be in compliance with the uh, social distancing and the, and the restrictions that the state uh, uh, has mandated for those programs. So hopefully it'll be a fun and safe experience for, our, for kids later this summer. Uh, well, that takes us to council reports and actions. Uh, and uh, so I entertain any uh, council reports and actions for many of my fellow counselors. I'll jump in. I uh, participated this morning in the um, Economic Alliance, uh, the La Plata County Economic Development Alliance board meeting, and uh, it was really quite um, well prepared as usual. They started with a, a report on the fiscal health uh, and the cash flow of what we can anticipate for the alliance uh, in and going through the burn rate. So. Um, well, we still need to collect membership fees for that. Um, we're sitting relatively stable with um, how much we know we're gonna be spending and what we have available in the bank. Uh, we looked at some of the GDP forecasts at a macro level and the unemployment and how that can be in impacting us here in the county. We looked at some of the um, uh, top concerns with uh, returning to business as usual and health and safety at work represented um, close to 50% of people's main concerns. Then the financial management and cash flow was a bit the second highest concern for them. Um, the new laws and regulations, business models needing to be adjusted, um, access to healthcare resources, PPL issues like that, hiring and rehiring, and then resuming um, supply chain, and then with IT. So those were some of the big issues that uh, we're hearing from the business community about issues uh, for uh, recovery. Then um, the Alliance in particular has been working very hard on the variance application with the county, both for the train and for events and public meetings. So they've been working on that. They're starting with um, visit, along with Visit Durango and the um, uh, Association of Realtors to target Durango as a place to really promote for that lone eagle, the person who can work from home and um, or commute to work in a different location through the 
what you what might have been domestic travel or international travel and ways to try to attract um, so some members of some potential members of that uh, economic base into the community. So that's a interesting effort um, there. They're also looking at the aid to all, which we had talked about a while ago, and that should be um, coming to a launch sometime in June. Uh, they've been working with the city on some of the task force and the different um, sectors, particularly manufacturers. The process improvement uh, committee that they've been working with other members of the community with the planning com uh, departments for the city and for the county. Um, the, the, it's kind of shifting. I think we'll get an update from that maybe from Kevin and others later, but the focus tends to be more on really addressing issues around La Posta and the URA. And then the sewer study is complete and I haven't seen it yet, but they'll be presenting that in June. And then um, we just also looked at uh, kind of some of the things that we need to be uh, addressing continued outreach to our members of the Alliance. And then um, we'll be having our membership uh, meeting next week, Tuesday in the morning via Zoom. So that's, uh, that's this morning's meeting. Thank you, Barbara. Anybody else? Uh... Sure. Happy to. Um, I have a couple things I wanted to ask council about and talk about in my update. The first I wanted to bring up, which I emailed council about, was um, how we want to respond to the Parks and Rec letter that we received um, from our Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Um, Mayor Brookie, you may have uh, more detail on this, so um, please feel free to chime in. I did talk to um, Councillor Bettine, he is the liaison to the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Um, and I asked him um, if he could provide me a bit of a perspective on um, that letter um, and, um, and, 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 and any support information that he might have. He did suggest that, you know, the count that advisory board is anxious to move forward in the discussion of these projects uh, that we deferred, the parks and recreation projects that were deferred. Um, and um, so I wanted to bring that up to council and, and talk about, first of all, how we, how we might want to respond to that and or when. Uh, maybe we designate another time to talk about it. But I just thought since we did receive that letter from our advisory board, I wanted to figure out kind of how we were going to respond and, and um, in what manner. One of the things that I, I think is key in this situation with the bridge in particular over 32nd Street is the GoCo grant and the advisory board's concern of the, um, the fact that if we don't uh, move on that in some capacity, um, which could also include the request for an extension, given the deferment of our project, um, of all projects really, um, we could request a uh, a, an extension of six more months, and possibly even a year, so that we don't lose that grant in the interim before we've had more time to evaluate. Um, Chris Bettine's, Councillor Bettine's thought was that, you know, we still have these project on deferment for a reason until we know what the outcome is of our situation. Um, that was his perspective that, you know, we really uh, difficult to engage um, at this time until we have potentially a, a little bit more information on where we are um, in the next few months as far as um, uh, shortages of cash flows and funding needs. So I just wanted to bring that up first and foremost to talk about how we might uh, move forward with that letter. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, the, the and I think it's the same letter, the letter that I read uh, at the request was from their board chair that was asking uh, in the, the points that I took uh, were primarily they wanted, they were very interested in seeing the alternatives uh, that uh, have been um, studied for the alternatives to the 32nd Street Bridge Crossing. And um, so, uh, you know, I think that's certainly in my mind, reasonable thing to allow them to uh, weigh in on uh, if that information is available and it should be. Uh, and I was thinking that uh, we, this could be a good topic for further discussion at uh, study session next week. Uh, we actually get a copy of that letter in front of us and review the various points and see what kind of action we can recommend uh, uh, be taken relative to that letter. And uh, so the other point that you brought up was that they 
it, and this is the part that I don't remember that letter, so thank you, uh, is uh, their desire to review all deferred projects, perhaps, uh, uh, relative to that status and uh, the, the, you know, what, the, what, what would trigger us to make that not a deferred project. And I think that Councillor uh, Noseworthy has referenced several times, she was wanting to see, you know, how, how we, when we can release the, not be an emergency status. And I think it's, a, it, personally, I, I'm a little more cautious. <laughs> I'm, I, you know, we've had really two really great months of sales tax uh, review. If we're just looking at the, the economic standpoint where we potentially have dodged a bullet, not totally, but uh, certainly not as, it's not the bazooka we thought it was gonna be perhaps, but I'm still a little cautious. And uh, uh, now might be the time for me to, say the a response from the policy group watching the modeling for the COVID, COVID virus is uh, everybody uh, uh, involved in modeling was uh, uh, concerned about them saying that the next two weeks are absolutely critical to uh, evaluate the, uh, uh, the impact of the reopening of businesses. And so the model over the next two weeks will be really uh, important to monitor and watch. We get those reports uh, from Centura and now from um, um, a source through CDH PME. So we got two models to compare, looking at, at it from a slightly different standpoint. Each agree that the you know uh, that we really need to monitor the the, re the impact of reopening, and uh, of course will then have direct impact on uh, potentially sales and uh, that kind of thing our, our community if we have a significant rebound. Then what do we do? Do we, um, you know, what what does that trigger? So, I, I think uh, in preparation for if we watch the monitoring of the uh, uh, models and uh, it's, there's certainly no uh, problem in my mind in allowing uh, various boards to look at those decisions that we made relative to deferments and, and uh, at least understand what we have done, the action that we've taken. I think they all do, but uh, that's certainly. I'd like to get their input in terms of which ones might have priority uh, and guide us in that uh, in that reprioritization as we come back. Councillor Noseworthy. Uh, yeah, several meetings ago, I did suggest, and and I was careful not to require, but I suggest that either Kathy Metz or Kathy and Amber might want to reach out to GoCo to uh, discuss the situation where we're at to explore opportunities because the budget I think has been larger than when, than when that proposal was submitted. And we have not received any indication from them of that conversation. Maybe it just hasn't made it into the schedule. But um, I do think that um, funding agencies often have flexibility in discussing and considering particularly situations such as this. So I think um, without directing staff, I think it's really important. I see Amber on there now. I think it's really important that we have that information from GoCo of what our options are. And I and I, I don't have the numbers immediately in my head, but I do know that our overall north extension of the Animus River Trail is larger than when that budget was originally submitted to them for that proposal. So that might influence their leniency in how that fund, those funds are applied. So as you were talking, I just reached back out to Kathy for an update of where we are with that. So hopefully we'll have that information in the near future and we'll send that on to council. Great, thank you. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. And I think for the public, because we I don't have that letter in front of me, unless, in, so Melissa, unless you have it, um, they should be able to access it, I believe, through the media at the um, uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Is that correct? How they could read that letter if they're listening and want to know more details? I'm not sure I understand your question. Are you asking? The letter that was sent to council, I believe it was oh. also part of the materials for the Parks and Rec Advisory Board meeting. Uh, I, I, and you're asking me what, what about it? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I, oh, I, I don't I don't have the letter in front of me, so I can't for the public listening, okay. give them a sense of what is oh, fully you. in it, okay. but I want to give them an access of how they could reach it. Yes, uh, I believe that came it was an email to city council. An email to council. The gist of that uh, email, that's a, that's a good point, uh, Councilor Noseworthy, was that they were um, 
seeking, they were requesting from council uh, them that they continue to review uh, the deferred projects and they would like that they would like to review those deferred projects. That was their kind of request to council. They have a meeting, I believe next week. And so time, you know, and so that's why I kind of wanted to bring it up just to make sure we had the conversation. Um, and what I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not the liaison, but since Chris is not here, I thought that we should address it. Um, um, and and I, I agree that we do need to get an update from GOCO on that grant. It would seem in the situation that we could get an extension um, on, on funding uh, for GOCO for grant, grants that are outstanding in this situation. It, 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 it would seem a very appropriate reason to extend. Um, so I'm hopeful that that would work out and then allow us some time to reconsider um, the projects that we've deferred. Thanks. An extension or even allowing us to use it for some of the increased costs that have come up as a result of the uh, it changes in time from when we submitted that proposal. I just like to see a lot of options for where we what we could be discussing with them. But I might just add that you know in the past the uh, GOCO has been very flexible and with us and, and I don't think uh, you know their, my other dealings with the state at this point were, were the least of their problems. And so many, many uh, budgets are being deferred. Um, and probably to say that we wouldn't use it till next year or later this year would come, would be music to their ears right now so, at the state. So, but if we could get an update, uh, 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 Amber, from uh, regarding that. And uh, also, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that the actual bids that came in for the bridge as originally designed came in under budget. Uh, uh, so don't want the public to have the impression walking away from this conversation that there was, uh, uh, that we, that the budget was exceeded, that we added a, a new uh, ramp and we added some additional features to that bridge that uh, uh, do in fact increase the budget over what it was a very, very original budget. But uh, in fact, the, the bids did come in under budget. So uh, that was right. a bit of good news. Uh, it was uh, good. Nonetheless, we've got three other alternatives that we're evaluating in the mix right now anyway, and that's what uh, the Parks and Rec uh, Board would like to uh, weigh in on and give us a, uh, a suggestion of what their preference would be. Uh, and so I think that's totally valid on their part, simple as that. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll keep moving on. That was, I'm sorry to, uh, I just wanted to make sure we had a conversation about that. Um, I, I did have a really good meeting um, with the strategy and long-term finance committee meeting. It was very, very productive. It was very helpful. A lot of really great information. We focused primarily on the um, on reserves um, and minimum reserve balances. Uh, started with the presentation, which Devin did, and she did. A, a, Devin Schmidt did in the finance department. She did a very, very good job, um, and um, a answered a lot of their questions that they had. Brought them up to speed. They were able to provide some really good. Um, kind of uh, uh, recommendations to us. I did ask that they consider um, putting something in writing um, as, as some advisories do um, as far as, you know, what they might suggest for minimum reserve balances for the general fund in particular, which is what we focused on yesterday. Um, and instead of getting into too many of the details here, I feel like it would be best if I waited to kind of go through all of those notes. I tried to take very copious notes um, and kind of when we have the discussion as a council, um, maybe bring those up. I think that it, we might be having this discussion in our retreat on July 8th. Um, that's what I conveyed to them yesterday. And then I could, I could take by, you know, 10 minutes before, you know, at the beginning of that discussion to kind of let you know uh, how the conversation went instead of taking up the time in the city council meeting tonight, if, if council's supportive of that. I would be very supportive of that. And that, that I am, uh, uh, thanks for reminding me about the retreat. I do have everybody's notes and uh, as, as usual, they range from being very broad to very specific. And I'm trying to include those all in, a, in an agenda that I'm preparing for consideration uh, by all of us next uh, for next Tuesday's uh, study session. So if uh, just know that I have uh, read, evaluated and collated everybody's thoughts and I think we can pack uh, most everything into uh, one concise day of a retreat. So uh, let's look forward to that and we'll, we'll go through that proposed agenda next week. Um, Since you're bringing it up, Mayor Berkey, do we have a, a, a 
facilitator, retreat moderator, any update on that? Um, we have, uh, Amber, can I defer to you on that? We have, we have uh, Sorry, both, on the both uh, of the alternatives in play at this point. We can have uh, all or parts of either one that's been previously proposed. Um, and I think uh, there's a place for both of them quite, quite possibly. So Amber, you want to see if there's anything oh, um, to say there. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Of course. Uh, so David Marvin is um, on hold and he's waiting to see if there are specific items that council would like to um, procure his services for, for a short meeting like was discussed um, at the last council meeting, Councilor Noseworthy had recommended perhaps an hour session to tackle one topic. That was one of the items, it could be an hour or two. Um, so he is, I will just say, waiting in the wings. So he knows that the, the full day retreat is not taking place the way that we had originally planned. And then Patrick Rondinelli is, has his calendar blocked for July 8th. Um, should that the council's um, agenda be related to um, items that he would be an appropriate facilitator for. So we have two facilitators um, that are ready and we're just waiting to see what the agenda would look like. And then I'm happy to work with Dean and help um, facilitate and make sure that we can make this happen. Yeah, and I think the timetable for that is uh, subsequent to our study session Tuesday. And that's- uh, well, We can talk about it next Tuesday when we're all five here. I think that's fair. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So, uh, and uh, that was that was certainly my intent, and I'll take any advice that you can give me. But uh, I think uh, I think there's a a little bit of everything in our agenda, and hopefully we can get through it in one day. So, um, so thanks for that. It would lead me into that. I'll check that one off of my list. But uh, thank you, Melissa. Um, and so I guess I would like to bring up with council. Um, or and or staff at some point, you know, we did receive the letter from Nina um, that they received grant funding for um, from, I, I'm not actually, I don't even remember where it was, $90,000 in grant funding for um, to assist with this navigation center. So I, I, I just wanted to know when, when we might be bringing that up again and talking about it um, and further discussions. I was just curious. It's actually, it's a, it's a, shelter if I, it's not a shelter it's a camp if I understand it correctly it's not necessarily a navigation center if I read that correctly. yeah I'm not yeah yeah I, yeah I, I'm not certain exactly I, I wasn't totally certain from the letter I think we would need more information um but I, I and and I without going into too many of the details now and or discussing I think that I just was curious if and we could talk about it tomorrow or uh, next Tuesday as well under new business. But I just what, what I would there he is the man. Coming, I would offer up that we do just something like that and put it on a study session because I I think it would make sense for staff to circle back with the, the county staff as well just get an update of where things are standing with them because uh, that letter did go to the BOCC county staff city staff the uh, city council. I know we've had some dialogue over the last couple of months with all of you counselors about um, some opportunities, but certainly the, the grant is new information to us. So, uh, you know, we can circle back on it here uh, when the time fits for you. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. That would be helpful. And, and Kevin, would there, uh, I know they've submitted an application to the city for use of that Elks uh, property at near the cemetery, near Greenlaw. Uh, is that appropriate? Uh, is that ready for prime time? Can we talk about that next Tuesday, perhaps? or at least get an update of where that's in the process. Certainly um, at the discretion of the council, how you want to proceed with that information, um, it is available. And, um, you know, staff has done some preliminary review on it, but largely have not processed anything relative to what a permitting process would look like, what resources would be necessary. Um, and it really has been a bit of a holding pattern uh, with COVID. Excellent. Well, uh, if if uh, if a council uh, obliged me to uh, uh, talk with uh, Kevin a little more uh, and see if it's an appropriate item to put on our agenda for study session next week, or if we continue it for uh, allow him time to do the tasks that he outlined uh, when he first spoke. 
So about right. checking right. with the county and so forth. But uh, in their their quest is to uh, obviously put some people in shelter uh, by this winter is the timeliness, the urgency of that. Uh, there's a really nice article in the Herald about the how things are setting up at Purple Cliffs and uh, quite a bit of public publicity about uh, how, how life is happening at Purple Cliffs and uh, some people are enjoying life up there as well. So I think that dinner's in the picture uh, as, as certainly amortizes some of the investments the county and the city have made in, uh, at, at Purple Cliffs. Um, still doesn't solve the problem, <laughs> quite honestly. But at any rate, yeah, thank you, Melissa. Anything That's else? Uh, thanks, thanks. Uh, Councillor Baxter, did we hear from you? Or? Um, no, actually, I didn't have a reporter action this evening. Well, well that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> no problem. Uh, well, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, then and say that, uh, uh, you know, this next two weeks relative to masks in our community, uh, you know, we're getting, the council hears you. We hear the community. We hear the people that are uh, uh, appreciative of the mask ordinance. We hear the people that feel it's a definitely a uh, violation of their First Amendment rights and uh, can't get over the fact that the you know, a community like Durango would impose something uh, that onerous on, upon them. Uh, we heard it this evening earlier, and certainly uh, uh, it, we did this action because we are uh, sitting next to uh, San Juan County, New Mexico, which on all modeling is uh, one of the hotspots in the nation. The Navajo Nation is uh, consistently, um, uh, although their curve is uh, coming down, uh, they're no longer in an upward curve. They're now in the downward curve. But the uh, new relief, uh, they had, and I'll just look at my notes here from, uh, they had, um, they have about 208 um, new cases per day still happening in the Navajo Re Reservation. Uh, they're up to 6,577 reported cases. Uh, I won't bore you with the deaths, but it's a significant number. Uh, and so when I hear things like that, it's a fairy tale, or it's certainly, it doesn't exist, COVID does not exist in our community. That's a tribute to the sacrifices that our businesses have made, uh, personal, everybody in our community that's uh, really did a great job of social distancing and really took this uh, event seriously. That's why our numbers are so low. It's not because it doesn't exist. It still exists in our community from a medical standpoint. Um, and we got a couple more weeks of this, and it is the critical next two weeks. So I, and I encourage our businesses to help enforce. Uh, I, we've heard loud and clear that maybe we need to assist with that effort a little more ardently, so that uh, it's not left to our uh, business owners to uh, to self enforce. Um, it is the law, and uh, and that's uh, that's where we'll be for another two weeks uh, until the 19th of June. Um, so. Uh, there's that. Uh, on, on a lighter issue, uh, Amber Blake, Interim Manager Amber Blake and I will be uh, talking uh, at Eggs and Issues, the Chamber of Commerce Eggs and Issues tomorrow at noon, actually 11.45, I guess it starts and goes till one o'clock and then it'll be, it'll be a, a, a panel of folks, uh, uh, the, the city, the county, and uh, I'm not sure who else is all involved in that, but uh, it should be a robust discussion about uh, where we're at, we'll give a brief uh, about 10 minutes of worth of what the city is doing and how we're doing it and, and what's new at the city tomorrow at lunch. That's a Zoom conference that will be available. Uh, I assume that can be accessed through the Chamber of Commerce website and just sign on. It's, there's, it's a free lunch because there's no food. So just us. So, uh, and that's only worth what you pay for. So uh, with that, uh, I might say also, I want to reinforce that there is a, a free, free testing, uh, COVID testing uh, at a number of sites um, done by uh, Cedar Diagnostics and Mercy Hospital. So I don't have the exact locations because they just moved recently. So, uh, but that can be uh, obtained by getting on the San Juan Basin Health website uh, or the Mercy website. It would have uh, instructions on where you could uh, obtain a free drive-through um, 
coronavirus test. And I think that, that'll become more and more important as time goes on, especially during the next two weeks as well. Um, that's really all I have. And, and, uh, Dean, Dean, yeah. Um, yeah. I've, gotten, I've gotten quite a few emails and, and phone calls about the status of the city manager search. So oh. I wondered if you could give a quick update on the notebooks. Um, I sent my, my rankings in, um, what the timing is for that and kind of the conversation with Slavin. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Barbara. And that was um, highlighted and I, I was on my last page, but I uh, didn't get there. Thank you for that. Um, so we uh, we have uh, the, the, the RFP for a new city manager has been out for a number of months. Uh, there have been uh, over 50 responses and we just received a packet uh, actually a week, two weeks ago. Uh, it, we've had in our possession for about a week and a half now, uh, a hard copy of the resumes for the top 10, if you will, uh, that were selected by Slavens. They took those 50, called them down to the top 10, and those were presented to each of us uh, in, as individual city councilors to respond to, uh, fill out a form to rank them and uh, send them back to Slavens, um, who is our consultant to uh, uh, shepherd us through this process. Um, it's my belief that we've all now sent them back to Slavens. Uh, so they will be, um, he will be uh, collating those, uh, compiling those uh, during this next week, uh, whether he has those responses to us by Tuesday or whether he has those uh, by the, you know, what calls a special meeting perhaps, or um, but um, uh, to allow us to, uh, so that we see what cumulatively we have uh, picked as the top 10. Um, and then um, then he will, um, um, these are all still confidential at this point, because uh, obviously these candidates have existing jobs in their own communities, most of them, many of them. And so uh, um, Slavens would like to talk to us in an executive session about that and see if, if uh, there's any modification of our previous selections and at least have a little discussion about how he compiled them if there was any abnormalities or uniformities there and then uh, um, and then that would allow him then to take uh, a consensus of those of his uh, top four how many ever we want four five or six individuals uh, to begin background checks um, and so at that point um, those people would be notified that they are in the short in the in the hunt, if you will, and uh, they would be have to sign a disclosure that would be their first outing, if you will, to their employers and so forth, and also allow for back background check. So that would be happening uh, within the next couple of weeks, I think, if we can orchestrate that, allow him time to uh, make that uh, that um, compilation, get back with us, have a short executive session. That could happen either Tuesday or it could happen after our um, city council meeting two weeks from now, which is what I, uh, I, I really think that's a logical schedule two weeks from now. It probably gives him ample time to do that. Um, and um, so I think that's what we should expect. And then we can make a public announcement. Certainly no, no names at that point, but certainly update the public on what the process is, but it is still moving ahead. And, um, and uh, we do have some, some good candidates um, and, uh, and that's all pretty much all I probably ought to say about that. Can I just add, um, because I got this question that not only did we look at their resumes, but that each of the applicants had to respond to extensive number of questions about style experiences, uh, and provide greater, um, background information to different experiences. So I think it's important to talk about the thoroughness of that. And, and I think there might've even been 55 applicants in yeah. the initial thing. So I just wanted to clarify that for the public. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank I also you. wanted to clarify, Dean, that I, I, at least in my packet, I think I received 21 applications um, to rank, not 10. So maybe we're narrowing it. Yeah, it wasn't a 21? No, it was 10? Okay. Uh, not for me, I, I didn't receive 21. I have yeah. my right here. <laughs> okay. So do I. Okay. Maybe so. Maybe I'm just multiplying it because I was so excited. Who knows? Have you read them forwards and backwards? Probably. Exactly. There we go. <laughs> Three maybe times. you counted the resumes and the answers as two different items. That's possible. Well, that's, that's, well and, and to Barbara's point, yeah, if, if I'd had 21, Kim, I'd have still been reading by now because they were so <laughs> thorough. They, uh, uh, and to Slavin's credit, uh, 
they they cut it down to this, uh, this the first cut, and then they requested a follow up letter to specific questions uh, about Durango that were formulated from their from current concerns, uh, our financial situation, our uh, budget issues, our uh, city man, uh, our lack of a city manager for a period of time, our lack of a city uh, finance director for a period of time, and so uh, and uh, all those things. In direct responses by those 10 candidates to those questions was very thorough. And, uh, you know, whether I liked the candidate or not and their qualifications, I thought that their responses uniformly were, uh, uh, they took this uh, application very seriously. Whether I think they're a great candidate or not, it was, uh, I, I have to give them all credit. Uh, it, everyone was virtually, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, whether they're a good candidate, they were good writers and they had great backgrounds. And so I think Slavens is to, as Barbara's point, was a, a thorough process and um, and uh, we're getting a well-vetted uh, um, list of candidates, so. Ah, you know, Dean, you know what it was? It was 11 candidates. Yeah, well, they're, and it's still open. As of right now, the, the official statement is open until filled. And so, yeah, there was um, uh, actually an initial 10 one dropped out and we received another application uh, that was that second little package uh, that we're aware of. And, uh, you know, so uh, so we're, I think we're at a net 10 at this point, but, but you could be right. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go count right now and make sure I got them up, but uh, thank you. And uh, any other thoughts on, uh, any other comments for the good of the city or anything we need to inform the public? With that, um, I'd like to close this meeting of the Durango City Council meeting of June 2nd. And uh, next year, ne next meeting, I'll be a year older. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs>